we have our first esteemed speaker, uh, Professor Tanja Sichvonen from the Communication Studies at the University of Vasa. She will be paving the way for us to understand this theme with her keynote on the future existences of art and culture. Please give a warm welcome to Tanja. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to see you all here. Um, I'm not a morning person. Uh, how many of you are morning people? Yay, hey, it's a minority still, so I'm not alone. Um, so I have um, like a million slides. I have, a, I have a big theme. I have a very bold title, as you can see, with um, very big words crammed in. And this is entirely my own fault because B asked me to make a, a beautiful title for the, and of course I made it in like a half a minute and then I came up with this and it sounds really great. But I'm actually not sure if this is what I'm going to be talking about. Let's see how that works. We have a lot of technology here. We have bright lights. Uh, I have this mic which seems to be working, right? So we're sort of ready to to go. I'm used to starting everything quarter past anyway. But I'm also used to working in a 1.5, 1 1.5 1 an hour um, uh, sort of time frame. So uh, I'm not sure if I have like all the ra if the bloodthirsty reindeer are going to come and catch me like five to to ten. Um, let's see how much time I actually have for this uh, for this talk. So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm I would like to provide you with some food for thought and some provocation in thinking about these really big, bold words. And I have a very weird look at sustainability, so don't get your hopes up um, on that. Uh, let's see if my, I can get this working. Yeah. So who am I? I'm, a, like you just heard, professor of communication studies. I, my background is in media studies, actually, and I'm specialized in digital media and games, especially. Um, I was uh, specifically asked not to talk about artificial intelligence. Um, I couldn't avoid it entirely, and I have a good reason for that. But I might save that for a, uh, for uh, the closing of my, my speech, um, this uh, justification for talking about AI as well. Um, I'm, I'm calling it slightly different, so if that gives me any excuse to talk about it, uh, I hope you'll excuse me. And I know that you will be talking about AI in other instances during this event. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's, it's fantastic to be here. It's such a privilege to be part of this kind of uh, an event which marries together the art world and something like you know, research on technology and ICT, where I come from. So I'm not an, uh, a researcher of art in any way. That's why I'm going to talk about technology mainly, and maybe also a little bit about creativity. Let's see how that goes. Um, so I, I, you know, I also hope that you can actually see my slides because I have a lot of pictures with a lot of <laughs> defined details in them. Um, there are other screens here as well. I don't know if that helps help you in any way, but um, so um, what I would like to start with is uh, just to give you a context of what, where I'm going to be speaking from. When we look at how art has been created for centuries, of course there was, like if you look at pictures of artist studios or art class or things like that, the most of the paintings depict a scene where there's nothing digital in them. There's not, there's not even analog radio or anything like that behind them. But if we look at how art is produced, how creativity expresses itself, how these networks are also part of the art world, we are looking at a completely different picture. And we are looking at situations where art classes are held online, art exhibitions are held online, art is being auctioned online, and so on. So we can't escape the world of digital media or social media entirely. That's where I'm going to be talking about. Um, so uh, what I'm going to uh, actually focus on, I have three points, three key takeaways for you for today. And this is the context where I'm moving. Um, and this is very much based on my own research as well. So 
Firstly, I would like to point out that um, there's such a thing as platform economy, attention economy, which is something that is uh, here to stay. We can't escape it. It's, it's kind of sprawling everywhere. It's uh, dictating how we communicate, how we do work, how we, co um, how we come together in meetings like this even. Um, Actually, this was um, beautifully metaphoric, seeing how the technology was set up this morning, because um, as we all know, uh, a lot of our interaction is mediated by different kinds of technologies, and the, in, in to an extent that the technology itself is sort of structuring uh, everything that happens around it. So the human communication is actually made possible by technology, but it's also structured by it in such a way that we couldn't think about it without the, the techno technology anymore. Um, here's my provocation, number point number two. When authenticity is produced the right way, it sells. It's, we kind of buy it, we like it, we want to have it. Um, so things like real and fake, um, uh, authentic and non-authentic kind of slightly uh, change their meaning in, uh, in digital media. And then when we talk about creativity, this is my, my take on sustainability, which is the theme of the event as well. Um, I think that creativity takes many forms, which we have to be kind of aware of in, in digital media and social media. Some of them might be sustainable, many of them aren't. I, w I want to be positive here, so I didn't put the negative version of this sentence here. Let's see how that goes. So first about platform economy. So you've probably heard about platforms. Is there someone who is absolutely not on social media in any way? Is there someone who would like not to be on social media? We were talking about psychological safety, so I'm not going to probe you any further, but of course this is something that we have to talk about. Um, so let's take Facebook, for instance. It offers its employees such great benefits, like in the US context especially. So we're talking about free lunches, free healthcare, gyms, childcare, you know, all these leisure facilities, uh, free snacks. So they basically can live on the, in the offices and have a perfect life and do a little bit of work as well. The, the other side of that picture is that these people who moderate the content for Facebook also work for Facebook, but they don't live their best lives. They have horrible living conditions. Going through the stuff that is posted online, which violates the norms in every way imaginable. And these people are psychologically traumatized, you know, deranged. They have like horrible, horrible conditions for doing this kind of work. So when we are talking about platform economy, we have to remember that there's kind of layers upon layers of virtual work that manifests itself in totally different ways, depending on the context that we're looking. Um, when we talk about the content that is produced online in these platforms, so first of all, maybe I should re remind you that um, when, we, when we talk with young people today, there, for them, the, the world of digital media presents itself through two things. So there are apps that you can access. So this is the device that you use, right? There are apps and there are browser-based things. That's it. As some of us are older, we may remember things like newspapers, the television, the radio, right? You know, so there are like a lot of things. We might even talk about like going online to the internet. But young people today don't think like this. And of course, free, feel free to challenge me on this. My, my, my sort of uh, understanding of this is based on, on our students. We have about 400 students majoring in com communication studies. And these are kind of interested in communication, like they're studying it and they want to become professionals on it. So. Their understanding of it is like, you know, when we talk about something like the television, they're like, what is that? Like, do you mean the screen? Do you mean the streaming services? Do you mean something different? And then, so you have to specify what you're talking about. So what we're, what we're actually talking about here, what I call the, the world of digital media, 
or social media is, is absolutely kind of a mix up of all these different technologies, previous technologies coming together in this one gigantic mismatch, uh, mix match of uh, different kinds of uh, strands of information, strands of content. And there's like no clear boundaries between different kinds of content. So we, have to, we need different kinds of tools to understand what's going on there. For instance, we can look, look at affection, we can look at affectivity, we can talk about things like affective capitalism, which means that our responses to that content, to that digital content which circulates in our channels, um, is the basis of some people and some platforms, some companies making a lot of money. This is the core of my presentation today. Moving on swiftly, um, where this is most visible and most sort of striking is of course social media. Remember, almost everyone is happily on social media here. Um, why we are there is the attention that we're giving to specific kinds of content or creators or conversations, groups, whatever, there ha whatever happens there. And Many of you have noticed probably that Facebook has been changing a lot this year. We are the Facebook generation, aren't we? So it's full of content that we haven't seen before. Who has noticed this change this year? That there's like a lot of things which has nothing to do with our friends, our family, our connections, our social networks. A lot of, co a lot of ads, from different places that are just there to make us pass more time on the platform to, to try to get the content that we, we feel is valuable to us. And that's actually a, a really great business strategy because we're there for a reason. We are supposed to be there. We're supposed to be spending time there as much as possible. And if we get a reaction, an emotional reaction about something, even better. And if that reaction that we're getting is negative, that's the best of all. So we are in a situation where our technologies have created a world where we are tr sort of trapped in this negative loop where we are supposed to feel bad all the time about stuff and be vocal about it, have reaction, you know, have this angry or sad face or something. And this is kind of the basis of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, in the old times, you know, when I did media studies, we talked about the public sphere. This is a very grandiose idea about, um, you know, the public coming together, talking about big ideals, how the society should be run, how culture works, how we deliberate about important democratic principles and things like that. And the the place where this was supposed to happen was the newspapers and maybe some serious TV programs as well. So this is the Habermasian ideal. Um, of course, you know, it worked for some time, but I argue that now we are sort of beyond that. We are in a situation where these different spheres of media have come together in a way where we have no longer have access to the kind of public sphere that once was there, that once was kind of the, the source of intellectual debate about politics. That doesn't exist anymore. When we go on social media, when we talk about politics, it's often a very different kind of conversation. So how do, how do those kinds of conversations actually help democratic ideals you know, spreading, gaining more ground, educating us, informing us to make better decisions. I wonder, not very easily, and of course this is all tied to kind of the ownership structure, the business models of these different kinds of ways of delivering information, talking about them, and um, you know, building these platforms. Um, I have these beautiful arrows, which are like this is this is the, this is the level of my graphic design. So I'm I'm not I'm not like one of those 
yeah, so um, I've also tried the AI tools making my presentations. That was great f to, to an extent, like it always is, but um, not a solution by any means. Um, I want to take three examples of this big scheme that I just talked about. Um, how many of you have heard about Hydraulic Press Channel? It's a very popular YouTube channel run by two people from, I guess, from Tampere. Is there anybody from Tampere here? Two people. Where, are, where is Tampere? Tampere has not sent their big cohorts here. Anyway, we have Hydraulic Press Channel. So it's a YouTube channel which was founded by a young guy who was studying to be an engineer and whose family had a business of uh, hydraulic press. So they had basically this place of pressing things into shape. Like this is as much as I understand it. And this was an actual place. And the young guy was there like, yeah, you know, you know, it presses things to shape, like metal in different shapes. And this is my life. Like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. That was a good business, you know, there was nothing wrong with it. And then he s sort of thought, well, you know, why don't I just videotape it and put it online to this YouTube and just have fun with it. And it grew to an enormously popular channel. This is one of the biggest YouTube channels in Finland, like, like everywhere in the world, because it, they, of course, started doing it in English as well. And it grew, I think, I don't have the year here, but I think it was started in 2015. And <coughs> I don't know if you can see it, but it has 8.6 million subscribers. I mean, the population of Finland is like 5.5. .5. So we're talking an enormous popularity for channels like this. And what do they do? They, they press things, they crush things, anything. I have, a, I have a picture of what they're doing. So they have a real human tooth. Like, wouldn't everybody want to know what that looks like? Crushed. Um, balloons. Um, you know, some clay. Uh, vegetables, food items, everything. And that's just fascinating for people to watch how they crush. And so this channel grew up to be so popular and so famous that they actually stopped doing it in the place, in the press place where they were doing it for I don't know how long as a family business and focused on making these videos for YouTube. Right? So this is the kind of transition that I'm talking about here. And when we look at how popular they are, what, what they're doing actually online. So we're still talking about quite young people. They're, they're like in their 30s now. Um, so they have an Instagram, obviously. They have Reddit. They have Facebook. They have several YouTube channels. They have their Patreon, where you can kind of sponsor them, give them money directly. And they have their own shop. Online. So they have their own merch, obviously, because like if you're a fan of crushing things, you might want to buy a t-shirt telling everyone that you're a fan of crushing things for $30. Okay, that's exa example number one. And of course, if you are, when we are in this world, things like, so it used to be a married couple who did this. They got divorced, unfortunately. That's very, very sad for them. Obviously, it also made beautiful headlines in the news. And that was extremely good for business. So whenever you can kind of leap over to the sort of what we used to call the media and make headlines there, it brings back maybe 100,000 new followers and subscribers to your, YouTube, to your YouTube channel. And they also have a game. You know, that's also a beautiful news story because somebody had an idea of a game of crushing things, brilliant game idea, and somebody pitched it. You know, the big game comp corporations were not interested in producing that, so a student made it themselves, and it's like a million dollar business now. 
obviously. So this is, this is the world that we live in. A second example. Has anybody heard of this uh, YouTube channel? I don't know why I like, have these YouTube examples today, but this is always a surprise. Never, nobody has ever heard of it. <clears throat> so this is a channel which is also started by a couple. Um, they have two young kids. Um, they are English and German, I believe. And they bought a French chateau in the countryside. So that was crumbling away. And they have started renovating it. And they started making this funny YouTube video series about how to renovate a chateau without killing your partner. And um, so they immediately gained a huge following because who wouldn't want to know how to renovate a chateau in the French countryside? Of course, we all want to know. And um, they started two years ago. And this is what it looks like, so very emotional content as well. I don't know if you can see the details, but... Um, so there's the, the husband and wife, and they're doing all kinds of funny stunts. And here she's crying, and the, the title of the video, It's So Hard, dot, 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 crying face. And then they're really happy, their children ran away, that's a funny story. And then they have like, you know, you can't believe what happened. We had all these amazing things happening. There was like some deer who came and ate their bushes, whatever. That was a dramatic video. And so you produce quality content that elicits emotions from our, our, us viewers. And then you have a video after, you know, kind of this, uh, this in, in this series, which says, I'm sorry, we have to say goodbye to all of it. And then everybody's like, oh, Oh my God, what has happened? I need to watch this. I need to know everything. You know, there's something dramatic happening. And then there's the video which says, you know, here's the, the title of the video. Is, we have to say goodbye. And then there's this kind of very serious face, a very kind of somber atmosphere. And he's saying, we needed to make a choice between doing the chateau as a guest house or YouTube, because they both take too much time. And guess what we have chosen? We have chosen YouTube, of course. They had 800 guests in the chateau for years, and they've stopped that, because it's too much work compared to the cost and benefit, the business of making YouTube videos, right? So why would you, like you have a chateau in the, in the French countryside which has like a hundred rooms. You're renovating them painstakingly one by one and you kind of invite guests from all over the world to have this amazing experience, to post about it on their Instagram, attracting new guests and all this kind of business runs on its own. But you decide that's too much work. You know, we're going to stop that. No more guests. No more renovation. We're just going to do YouTube videos which show the drama of our everyday life in the chateau. So this is the world that we live in. Here's the re some reactions to that video. You obviously can't read them, but they're like, I almost cried with relief when you finally said, it was not the videos, it was the guest house that you were stopping. You know, your videos mean the world to me. Um, you guys, I thought we were breaking up. What a difficult decision, but selfishly, I'm relieved. You've decided to continue with YouTube. Because, you know, what else is there? A third example. Who is this? Auri Kananen, yes. A very famous Finnish YouTuber who is cleaning people's homes for free. And this is her selling point. She is cleaning disgusting, moldy, you know, um, hoarders' homes for free. And her tagline here, says, hi, I'm Auri Katarina, and I deep clean dirty homes for free, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. 
And then she goes on to explain what she does and how disgusting it was, how many bugs there were, how much mold there was, and how she cleaned everything painstakingly for free. And then you think, wow, I could never do that. Let's see what disgusting filth she pulled out from that sewer this time. And then you go there and you look at, oh, let's see that in close up again. And then, you know, you look at her doing it. And then there's, of course, the most important thing on social media, which is the before and the after shots of the process. And she does this for free. I hear that recently she moved out of Finland. And you know why? Any guesses? Sorry? She, that's actually close to truth. Scrub Daddy, yes. She has a very, very good sponsorship deal. Any other guesses? Uh, yeah, I don't know about taxes. Could be also a factor, but mostly because she couldn't find dirty enough homes. You know, if you, if, you, if you take this global, think about the possibilities of finding new interesting kind of gunk in people's homes. And then you think like, wow, she's such a, an angel doing this for free, going through people's garbage. And then there's another side to that story. She owns her business 100%, and at the moment, this is from one week ago, it's worth 1.5 million euros. So, by making YouTube videos of cleaning disgusting homes for free, you can actually make a decent living. And uh, in light of this, of course, the whole picture is that she's not charging for cleaning. That's not the point of the business. You know, in the old world, you would go to somebody's home, you would clean, and you, then you would get a little bit of money and walk away with it. In today's world, you find disgust, disgusting, dirty house, you clean it, you make a video of it, and you continue making tens or hundreds of thousands of euros on the basis of that video. This is the world that we're living in. And this, as a symbol of this change from real work to virtual work, we have situations where, you know, like the internet subcultures, which are, you know, promoting these things, which are financing these things, which are sort of liking and subscribing to these YouTube channels. Some, sometimes they kind of pop to the surface and take over the, the billboard on Times Square with Pepe, which is the, far-right mascot. So what we are talking about here is what I have called social media influencer communication. Usually this is talked in terms of marketing, but I'm more interested in, in, in it as a communicative practice because I think that this is not just a commercial thing. They are not promoting themselves per se, but they genuinely want to create a relationship with their readers or their subscribers or their followers or their likers. They want to have that emotional reaction which is based on continuous engagement and they want to appear authentic doing it. So here we come to the produced authenticity part. Um, I'm going to skip this. How you produce authenticity in social media? You do it by engaging bots. So if you think that this is humans who are doing these things online, who are making content, who are organizing it, who are filtering it, who are receiving it, who are talking about it, that's not what's happening. It's, they are systems where humans are working with me different kinds of mediators or algorithms that kind of manage the whole structure of communication. So what this is, 
the kind of part which I was not supposed to talk about, which relates to AI, which I chose to call algorithmic authenticity. Because we still crave, you know, other humans. We want to have a direct contact with another human being, even if it's through media. We want to kind of see somebody's face. We want to see someone, someone crying. You know, tears are the gold of social media. Like if you have tears, that's like absolutely fantastic. And what the situation has become in the recent years is that we have these social media platforms which are populated by different kinds of small programs or bots which manage all the interaction which happens on those platforms. And we, if we want to operate on those platforms, if we want to understand how it works, if we want to understand how somebody can gain 8 million subscribers on YouTube by pressing things, we have to understand how those platforms, how those contents, content streams are managed by different kinds of bots. Um, you have probably, I mean, it's, it is a little bit unethical to show this picture. You know why? Yes, but I mean, I have other dead people on my slides as well. Any other guesses? Yes, thank you. I don't know who said that, but somebody from the shadows. Um, she never appeared smiling like this in public. But we crave to see a young, beautiful woman smiling. Because that's what we're used to. Right? We, we, we want to see a public face of somebody so, be, so pretty and so kind of you know, inviting and everything. And we want to see a pretty smile. And now we have the tools to make that happen so that it does not appear inauthentic in any way, right? So, you know, if I hadn't told you that the right side image is computer generated, you wouldn't have known. And this is incredibly unethical uh, if you start thinking about it. Of course, this is just a smile. You can argue that's not a big deal. But then if we kind of go into the world of deep fakes, it starts getting nasty and very messy very quickly. I'm not going to go there right now, uh, primarily because I have like five minutes left. Um, instead, I'm going to kind of run through my rest of my slides and point to you things like um, what I have discovered in my research. Everybody's talking about fake news, uh, you know, bad news, uh, disasters, earthquakes, natural disaster, catastrophes. War, of, of course, everything, these are all really, really great news that we all want to read about and interact with. But if we can kind of spin it into fake news, fake bad news, that's absolute gold. Because that elicits our emotional reaction again. And as you, can, as you remember, that is the gold mine. That's the data of social media. That's where everything hangs on. Uh, so when we talk about these fake contents, which elicit emotion, which kind of manifest in different ways, we can look at how they make bots do this, how they kind of organize the content streams in a way that um, appear authentic, genuine, you know, nice and constructive to us, but which instead are actually quite the opposite. So here's um, an example of a bot account, which starts following you. And this is from a manual of how to make bots work for you. And this is a negative example of how you do not want a bot account to follow you. Because this, is, this bot account, according to the writer of the manual, is not producing quality likes, okay? So we're not talking about like bots making comments such as great or okay or just liking things. But we're talking about the quality 
of the bot action, which works for you or against you if you're a social media entrepreneur or something. So I think that's pretty remarkable, actually. And of course, my favorite topic, TikTok, where I spend most of my time nowadays. Um, it's full of bots in, in both human and non-human, both algorithmic and human machine constellations, which, it, which makes it so incredibly fascinating for someone like me. And um, sorry about the quality of the pictures, but um, I've got like um, heaps of research material on how humans and machines together make it a special place for distributing authentic looking content that we love to interact with. This is kind of the epicenter of my research, as you can imagine. So a couple of words really quickly about um, the, the background or the history of human machine communication. It's not a new thing, of course. It's existed for at least 30 years. There's been big corporations like Microsoft that has been trying to make it happen on a commercial scale for at least 30 years. And they've, uh, they've always had some sort of virtual assistants or you know, bot systems built into their software, which are supposed to help us manage content and talk to others and you know, filter it in such a way that helps us talk about these things. You remember Clippy, perhaps? Uh, always a favorite, not very long-lived, um, but there was also others. An example of Bob is here. Um, Miss Dewey, another virtual assistant before virtual assistants were a thing. This is here to show that this was actually an actress that played the virtual character. So you are hiring an actress to play a virtual character in a computer system, which is a search machine. Fascinating stuff. Tay, a Twitter bot, which lived for 24 hours because it was a fast learner. And what Twitter thought would be fun to do with an AI bot, who's a fast learner, is to teach them a little bit about human history and art. So I don't know if you can read this, but she quickly became to think that this was a, the artistic masterpiece, uh, what you see on the right. We also have different kinds of bots. Slack bots, known uh, in companies, in many companies, um, managing all kinds of interactions within and also outside communication, external and internal communication. And then we have an example of a commercial tiny little bot which was supposed to battle hate speech. Again on Twitter, another recipe for disaster. In order to understand why these bots work in some surroundings and why not in others, it's helpful to understand something about what Twitter was and what X is. Like, Okay, X is gone. Like, no, we're not even going to talk about X. We're still talking about Twitter. But Love Bot Blue um, was managed by Fatser, and it was kind of a tiny little friendly bot that was searching hate speech online on Twitter on the basis of keywords and appearing to conversations and saying, tone it down, people. Be friendly. You know, don't use those words. And there was like such an influx of hate speech against the bot that resulted. Fascinating stuff. Okay, my last point, sustainability. I don't know if I'm uh, over time now already. We have tools, let's say fake brain tools that help us manage all kinds of things, both in work life and in our leisure time. So we're not only talking about social media, which by the way, for many is also a very important tool for working life. So it's not only, you know, chit chatting with friends. So, you know, this is the reality where we are living. I've had a master's thesis written with an AI tool last week. And I have to think about what to do with it. And I can't deny it. I can't 
say, okay, this is rejected. That's not an option. Um, we have tools that help us grow in social media, if we want, if, if that's what we want. If we want to start a business on social media, if we want to use digital media for our benefit in a way or another, that almost exclusively demands us to take some sort of media management tool in use. And there's lots, there's so many that you can choose from. In addition to getting a, a respectable media management tool, there are also tools where you can buy likes, followers, comments, views, shares, anything you want, just with a couple of clicks. And the funny thing about it is that often these kinds of, if we look at these kinds of tools, they can be, you know, in, in old terms, we can think of them as positive or negative. Um, they're actually made by the same companies. Just like the AI, oh sorry, the fake brains, um, content production tools and content detection tools. So isn't that the best possible business strategy of all time? That you create something and then you create the antidote of it and you sell them both. And this is the loop the next loop we're getting into. There's no way of escaping this world, right? So, um, fake brains is here to stay, and we have to deal with it, we have to understand something about how it works, and if we want to detect it, if we want to kind of understand what runs, what, how it's run in the background, and you know how its inner workings operate. We have to buy some software that helps us manage even that side of things. So if we say, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with this, that's not an option anymore. You have to pay either way. And I'm going to end with uh, a beautiful historical uh, um, sort of story about how the internet started in the early 1990s with this famous comic saying um, on the internet nobody knows you're a dog so that was the promise by which we were hooked on using the internet right we thought oh this is going to liberate us from our earthly shells and show the world who we really are and make us do whatever we want to do. The next stage is, oh, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Nobody. So we are online and we have no idea what's going on. Who's there? Who are these people? Are they dogs? Are they, ooh. The next stage is, all right, whatever happened to on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. So this is the social media phase where they definitely know you're a dog. Or they definitely know who you are, where you are, what you're doing, how old you are, which gender, which demographic, how much money you make. And here we come to do today, which is the situation that, of course, I'm human. And there are, there are bots that are producing the content, that are managing it, that are filtering it, and receiving it. So then the question I want to leave you with, to end this morning little talk, uh, what's the role of humans? And I'm out of time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tanya. That was really interesting. Am I, am I on? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. And I'm really looking forward to 
continuing talking to you at lunch and I hope that you're open to have people come in, comment and ask more questions from you after this. Yeah.